time. You pick a, a, a different value of K and you get a time shift in your phase up to some constant phase that this thing doesn't depend on any dynamic variables, right? It's uh, L and H are fixed from the initial data. K is sort of your free parameter. So what we can do then is we can, by picking, uh, picking this value K, we can always keep this quantity in parentheses in a fixed interval. And this is basically the period, but you pay the price of this constant phase, but this thing you can remove from the problem. It's just the, the gauge and variance of phase for NLS. So every time you advance by a period, you can actually use this to prove that the modulus of the solution of NLS for this problem is exactly periodic, but the phase every period uh, acquires a shift by this much, basically. Okay, so how does this inverse analysis go? Well, the favorite trick of uh, at least me for Riemann Hill problems is anytime you have a bunch of poles, you can interpolate them. And you don't have to, because we have this smooth interpolate for all of the poles, we don't have to do it one by one. We make one big loop and we interpolate the poles out onto some loop around them in one, sweep, in one swoop. Okay, so you pay the price, you get a jump on this circle now and on this little piece of the real axis because our interpolates above and below are different. Okay, but now there's no poles in the problem and it's the kind of thing you can do analysis on. So this is the type of jump you have and we have these crazy looking jumps. Okay, and then miracle number two for this problem, the reason it's so nice, normally this jump on the real axis has um, what you have up here is typically one plus mod r squared, okay? But this function, it, it's, the, it's one plus the product of these two things. Well, the product of these two things for this problem is one. So instead of having some complicated term that contains a bunch of poles, you just have a two. And that means that we can refactor this jump on the real axis and just push it out on so you factor it and you push everything out onto a loop that looks like this, okay? So now you've got a problem on a loop and this is when you start to think, okay, maybe I've got some Pamela type behavior in my problem. Okay, so this function, and, and here's where, where you really see it. We take this function A of zeta and we introduce a rescaled coordinate, okay? so. A, remember A is this uh, product, this Blaschka product looking thing. And so you can write it, if you want to, in, as N goes to infinity, it's going to look like some exponential. You write it as E to the sum of the logarithm of all the little uh, Blaschka factor terms. And then you put the rescaled coordinates in and this uh, sum starts to look like an integral. And because we know exactly what the eigenvalues are, we can actually say this thing's going to converge to this explicit integral. And so we get this nice simple form for how A behaves. And it has this, crucially, it has this behavior of one over the rescaled spectral parameter in it, okay? And once you have that, once you replace A by this thing, uh, I don't need to say anything here. You can also, you can write, this is basically I wrote on the other slide. So this is just the rescaled you put the rescaling into the X and T behavior and you get exactly just rescaled X and T in the risk. This is just the linear dispersion in the rescaled X and rescaled time. And then you have this phase that you can just get rid of by conjugation, okay? But what that means is you have, as epsilon goes to zero, you can take a limit and you get a model problem that looks like this. Okay, so you have some central factor, which is uh, just a constant matrix. And then you have the linear dispersion of NLS here. And then you have this one over lambda term in the rescaled coordinates. And in the rescaled coordinates, we choose the, the size of the disk, the interpolation disk. So that this is just a, in the rescaled plane, this is a disk of size one. And this Riemann-Hilbert problem, uh, Peter and Ravi had seen before, in some of their other works, which Ravi was talking about before, 
And you can recognize this. This is exactly the Riemann-Hilbert problem for a special solution of Panlevy three. Okay, so what we can, what you can prove is that so as epsilon goes to zero with x and t in some compact set, that the solution of NLS converges to this function psi. So you get out of this Riemann-Hilbert problem, and then you can do. Um, this thing, it just this, so you can. This is the dressing argument to show that this is a Riemann Hilbert Penlevé 3 solution of Penlevé 3 function. You put the phase at infinity, and then you uh, take you differentiate this. This, so this problem now has constant jumps in x and t, and so you can differentiate in x and t to do the dressing, and you get out a lax, what looks like a lax pair. And this is exactly the NLS. So the first thing is you can do this, you could differentiate x and t. So this is the lax pair for NLS. So that shows the limiting problem is a solution of NLS. And uh, so, so here's some plots of this function psi. That's not so important. What I want to say though, also you can do is you can also diff you can put the whole phase at, at infinity and you can also differentiate in lambda. Now you have uh, like a triple and you can look at the zero curvature relations between X and lambda. Okay, and that gives you this delightful equation, which is the second member of Saka's Penlevé three hierarchy. Okay, so that's how you see that this is Penlevé three. Okay, and then and the when t equals zero, uh, this whole Gary term drops out, and you have an explicit form for u, and then you what u is this uh, standard Penlevé three equation where you've set these parameters to zero. Okay. All right. I'm going to finish early so you can all go to lunch early. Um, so I just want to say that uh, Robbie talked about this before. So this is really special. It's not a. Uh, it's not something you're going to see for generic initial data. You have to pick very special initial data, but that doesn't mean you don't see it anywhere. You just have to have the right sort of thing. So um, these nth order peregrines are higher order. Uh, uh, rogue waves were studied by Dennis Billman, Li Ming Li, and Peter Miller. And then uh, Robbie and Dennis studied these nth order soliton solutions that we were talking about last time. So this, these are pictures of the nth order solitons. Okay. And this zoomed in behavior, if you zoom in right at these focusing points, it shows exactly the same sort of thing we're seeing for these semicircles. Okay. So it's non generic, but that doesn't mean it's, uh, you never see it. Okay, so that's sort of the end of my talk, but I just want to say um, there's some things we still want to do. So we'd like to study small dispersion limits for the whole family of Talanov pulses. Um, that's significantly more complicated because you have to do WKB for uh, functions with a complex phase. So that's ongoing work that we're working on. And uh, the other thing we'd like to show is that if you perturb this a little bit, we'd like to see if you can sort of say, how the Penlevé three focusing breaks, and maybe it interpret. Maybe there's a way to interpolate it back to the standard thing. And so this is a picture. I think Robbie was describing this last time, where you start with an onion, and then you uh, sort of interpolate it back into the Setch profile. So we can compute the norming constants for these the situation at least numerically, and you can sort of see how it breaks back to the sort of the norming thing. This isn't on here, but something I think might be interesting is so. All of this worked because the uh, way I think about it anyway, is all of this worked because this phase function was quadratic. So this guy was quadratic. So you could imagine if you could cook up some initial data where you got a cubic term, then maybe this would all work for the, for the MKD V flow, the third flow of the NLS hierarchy. So maybe you could do this for other problems or is there an analog of this for KDV maybe? Some way to get a non-generic uh, result for KDV. Anyway, that's uh, just a total thought experiment at this point. So that's it, thanks very much. Thanks, Bob. Uh, any questions?
by level three, what can you say about solution? So we, which is the, the problem for by level three that you show? How do you determine the solution? Yeah, that's that. Yeah, with this one. Um, so how do you? The by level three. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's uh, there's. I thought there was a slide where we said I said this, but maybe not. Let me see. Probably not. Where did it go? Yeah. So yes, yeah. you have this equation. Which solution is selected by NLS? Yeah. So. Oh damn! I didn't write it down. Do you remember? I Honestly, I don't remember that's we have it. I just I thought I had it written down the slide, but I don't remember the condition. There's a, uh, can you use a derivative condition at zero? Yes, yeah, it's, it's, there's some derivative at condition yeah, at zero. But... Well, yeah. I mean, I think we selected it with a derivative at zero, but I don't, I, I'd have to look at the paper. I don't remember off the top of my head. I'm sorry. So you can show that for any a solution exists or that, that there are problems? Um, I think it's global, but I, I, did, I, I, I didn't think about it too hard, to be honest. Yeah, it's, a, it's an ODE solution uh, should, it, uh, it's analytic ODE solution should exist ex except maybe some singular point some, uh, somewhere. Yeah, I mean, uh, no, for me, it's uh, the Riemann, so this Riemann-Hilbert problem has the right structure that you can just prove it has solutions. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Right, but for uh, what do I want to say? For each x and t, this thing has the right, the right symmetry to apply a vanishing lemma to it. So, uh, Bob, I have a, a little comment. Uh, yeah, you sure. said that there is a gradient catastrophe in the solution of uh, NLS. Yeah, it is in dispersionless. You mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Of course, the the uh, yeah. the shock starts to form, and then the dispersion smooths it out. Yeah, of course. Sorry. Other questions? So I had one, the, sure. uh, it, the SETCH profile, if you do semi-classical analysis of the SETCH profile, it's exact at integer values yeah. of, of uh, one over epsilon. Mm -hmm. Is there any uh, way to just find a variable change that changes the square root of one minus X squared into the SETCH potential? Is, it, is there possibly some connection? They're so different. No, I, I mean, I don't... If you had one, it would be some bizarre variable change because yeah, like you, you take change. something from whole line and then you make it compactly supported. Yes, that's yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think the variable change would break the problem somehow. Okay. Comments, questions, Gino. Just a, yeah. a question. You said this is non-generic. Yeah. And if I understand correctly, in this case, the the genus zero system, which is elliptic, uh, is the row that breaks that goes to infinity. And the other one is the U that breaks, right? Like you said, it's, it's the phase. Yeah. So in what sense one is generic and one is non-generic? Well, so the... The result of um, Marco and Alex, right, is you take something nice and smooth and it's a real analytic and you always get this behavior. So we, I mean, we don't, we can't prove it, but I suspect it has to do with this, um, the fact that we have this square root behavior at the edges of our support uh, gives you some control over the eigenvalues. Um, we did some uh, numerical experiments where you changed that behavior and this thing fell apart. So it's it's got something to do with this special semicircle shape. Other questions, comments? Thank you, Bob. Thank you.
And this concludes this today's session. We have an afternoon free for conversations, right? Is there something else going on that I should announce? Okay, so we reconvene tomorrow morning at some point. Nine, Nine o'clock. Oh, yeah, oh, there's some for the riffraff. <laughs> All right, thanks, everybody.